how to produce them and why it's such a fantastic thing to do. I call it the mothership of all exercises and today you're going to find out why. <laughs> Oh, what's that? What's that? The mug? Oh yeah, the mug. <laughs> I'm actually working on my merch at the moment, so I'll keep you all posted. But there should be like mugs and shirts and all that kind of malarkey coming up whenever I can get around to sorting it out. But yeah, sacks up your Sunday mug in the house. And, oh, I haven't got my mic on. So, I didn't have my mic on. That's a really good start to the session, isn't it? In case you didn't hear it because the mic was too quiet. I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson and you're watching Get Your Sax Together. Sorry about the technical screw up beginning to the session. However, we're now, <laughs> it's live though. We're now back where we should be. So yeah, got my new merch in and I'm gonna be getting that sorted soon. Sax up your Sunday mug right there. And this Sunday, you are getting a double dose of Get Your Sacks Together because you've already had the video this morning, which is on chord symbols, and now you've got a live. So get your questions ready because I'll be taking questions at the end after I've done the main teaching presentation. Um, you can ask anything you want about playing harmony, my experiences. You can even ask me about gear, but you know what I'm like with, that, with gear. I'll give you my best shot, but I'm not the biggest gear nerd ever. Now then, let's get the plugs out of the way. Just before I get to the plugs, I can see there's loads of people already in the comments. I'm going to go back and say hi to everybody a bit later on, but thank you all very much for joining me. Thank you all for the comments. That's absolutely wonderful. People from all over the world, UK, you name it, France, America. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Much appreciated. So, the big news is I am slogging my guts out at the moment, making my Total Tone Mastery course. Guys, this is going to be insane. It's going to be so good. This is going to be everything you need to get the sound of your imagination out on the sax. Everything you've always wanted to know. And the stuff I'm going to teach you today is included in the course. So you're getting a sneak preview of some of the teaching material from the course today. I'm busting my balls trying to get this out. It might be a week or two. Uh, hold on, definitely not a week. Hopefully I want to get it out before Christmas, which is probably bad timing from a marketing perspective. But hey, I just want to get it out to you guys so that you can have total tone mastery. So exciting times for that one. There is, as usual, a fantastic PDF for today's lesson. You can get it using the URL below, getyoursaxetogether.com forward slash overtones. Now that sheet has got... Um, Lots of information about overtones. Truth be told, I can't even remember. Oh, I do remember what I put in that sheet. I've got every overtone fingering for the different notes on the instrument. It's a really, really useful resource that I show you all the different ways that you can play all the different notes using overtones. So go and get forward slash overtones to get your PDF there. As always, you can check out my awesome free one-hour masterclass, which is a load of cool stuff about learning saxophone. Regular viewers will know all about that, and hopefully some of you have already watched it. But if you haven't, go and check it out. It's really, really cool. It's like a one-hour lesson with me that you normally pay a bomb for. So, getsaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. And I think that winds up the plugs. So, let's start getting into the lesson. But first of all, let's check in and say hi to a few people. <laughs> uh, I probably won't be able to get through everybody, but hi, Stephen, uh, Progetto, Charles from Iowa, Sue from Portland, uh, Coggleton Cheshire, Gary Whitaker from Ontario, Canada. I'm moving it to a Sunday to, to see if more people can come along this time. I've had Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. So we've got people I'm just going to dot around, uh, Sussex, Poland, Turkey, uh, Essex, yes, Woodford, nice. Um... Yeah, there's loads of people from all over the world. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to take your questions later on in the session, so get them ready. Try and catch me out. So in this lesson, what we are going to do today is three sections. First of all, you're going to learn what overtones are and why they're important. Then, in part two, you're going to learn how to produce overtones. This is the stuff that you don't find people talking about. Everyone says about overtones, but not how to play them. You're going to get the in-depth today, I promise you. And thirdly, you're going to learn how to practice overtones. I'm going to give you a few exercises from absolute beginner to very advanced 
that will bring your sax playing on quite the treat. So let's get straight into the teaching and start with what overtones are and why they're important. Lingered a bit long on that screen. <laughs> Okie dokes. Now then, overtones, put very simply, are when you finger one note and another note comes out. That is what happens when you play an overtone. You finger a note and then a different note from the normal note comes out. Usually, in this um, type of exercise, you're fingering low notes. So, harmonics are just the hidden layers that are built up within your saxophone sound that you can't normally hear. Normally when you play a note on saxophone you will hear the fundamental and that is the note that your ear will recognize. You finger a low C, you play it, everyone will hear a low C. However, the saxophone sounds like a saxophone and not like a sine wave or a trumpet or a harp because of these overtones. And they are shadows, shadow notes that your ear can't separate from the main sound, but they are what give the saxophone its quality. That's what overtones are. So, the overtones are a naturally occurring sequence that you'll find all across nature and in any tube that you blow. First of all, you have the root or the fundamental. Then the first overtone is gonna be the octave. After that, you go up a fifth, then you go to the double octave, you go up to the third, the fifth, the flat seventh, the octave, the second, third, sharp 11, and up and away from there. That is the harmonic series that happens when you overblow a tube. It's like when you do one of those bull roarers or when you blow a bottle, anything like that, the saxophone's the same, you get these, the overtone series. And that is what the overtone series would be in the key of C. Now, one thing to clear up is the difference between overtones and harmonics. Now, there are some fancy physics definitions which I don't fully understand, and I've tried to understand it, believe me. However, the main thing to note is that harmonics are numbered differently from overtones. We can just call harmonics and overtones the same thing for the sake of this video. But you have the fundamental. Now, that is actually called harmonic one. I've got a slide here which will demonstrate this. So the fundamental doesn't have a name in the overtones world because it's not an overtone. However, it does in the harmonics world. It's called harmonic one. Then you go to the second harmonic, which is the first overtone, and so on and so forth. So the harmonics are always one number ahead of the overtones numbering. You might come into bother if you get these mixed up and you're reading something that's more academic for saxophone. It doesn't really matter that much in the grand scheme of things. So why are overtones important? Overtones are so important because they're gonna get you right inside how the saxophone works, inside the very DNA of the instrument. You're gonna have to tune the shape of your vocal tract and your throat to the perfect shape, which is gonna make that overtone sound instead of any other overtone or the fundamental. Now, when your vocal tract is in the perfect shape, when it's dialed in, when that radio dial of your vocal tract is dialed in to that note, and then you switch to the normal fingering, your vocal tract, throat, mouth, embouchure, is in the perfect shape to resonate that note to its fullest. So you're gonna get a cracking sound. That is the power of overtones. Let's just see if we've got a slide on that, yeah. So as you can see from this diagram, you've got sound in your imagination. Now in your throat, you can imagine it like a radio dial, you're tuning in the frequency of your anatomy to make the overtone sound. That means that the resonance in your vocal tract is optimized and each note that you then play with the regular fingering is bang on centered and focused like a laser beam and you're gonna 10x your sound. It's just gonna be much bigger because all your ducts are lined up. Your breathing is good, your vocal tract is good and that instrument is gonna really sing when you tune in your vocal tract, you're practicing using overtones. That is the power of overtones. Now there's a few other benefits as well. We're gonna go through them now. So let's just go to the next slide here. Okay, 
what are the benefits of overtone practice? Number one, like I just said, there's synchronization between your vocal tract and your inner ear. This is a slightly different aspect to it. You have to hear the note in your ear and then your vocal tract will make the right shape and then the note will come out. So you're in training that relationship between your imagination and your inner ear and your body. Number two, you're gonna really even out all the differences in tone across the instrument because your reference point, and we'll find out this later, the reference point that you're using for your tone is a long fingered low note, which are all gonna sound quite similar. And you're gonna keep referring back to these great sounding overtones. So your tone across the whole range of the instrument is gonna be even and beautiful. As we've already discussed, number three, you're gonna get that real focused tone that really projects and cuts. It's not gonna be woolly or weak. You're gonna have a really strong focused tone. Number four, you're gonna be able to create tonal variety because you're using your vocal track to shape the sound in a different way from normal. You're gonna be able to alter your sound and have a variety of different tonal colors. Number five, this is a fantastic training ground for your altissimo playing. It's not necessarily exactly the same as playing altissimo, but you are really going to struggle playing altissimo if you can't get your high overtones out. That's just a simple fact of the matter, and you'll discover why just shortly. And finally, these overtones can be used for fantastic extended techniques that you might hear John Coltrane do, or Michael Brecker, or any modern saxophonist. So a slew of benefits. Overtones are really, really important to practice I call it the mothership or the Lord of the Rings exercise. One exercise to rule them all. This is the one exercise that I used to stand in front of my bedroom window when I was a kid. I used to have a little diagram up on the wall of like uh, lungs and a, and, a, and a throat and the sound being thrown out. And I would practice these overtones exactly as I'm going to teach you today. And that formed the cornerstone of the sound that I've got today. Super valuable very, very important thing to practice. So let's now move on. Now that we've discussed what overtones are, why they're important, let's go on to the real important bit, which is how you produce overtones. Okie dokes, now then. This is the part that most people will skim over <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> You'll find some vague things, you know, like put some pressure there. You you might feel the sound at the back of your throat or some vague stuff like that. That's totally understandable because it's very difficult to um, exactly articulate what's happening inside your body when it's all hidden and it's in the dark. Now, I am personally indebted to the work of Dr. Mark Watkins and his fantastic book, from the inside out. I can't recommend this book highly enough. And in his research, and this is a really seriously in-depth book, guys. In his research, he has taken uh, fluoroscopy images and endoscope images. Fluoroscopy is when you have a, a, a sort of live X-ray of what's going on with the tongue and the tissue in your vocal tract. Endoscopy is little miniature cameras and all sorts of other scientific skullduggery to create the ultimate um, along with other researchers, it's not just him, uh, to create the ultimate guide to what is really going on inside your body when you play saxophone. So this is where I can get some really hard edged information about how to produce overtones. So let's have a little look at some of the techniques. Okay, first of all, what we notice when uh, overtones are being produced in proficient players is that the center of your tongue arches. Okay, now it's very important that you keep the tip of your tongue anchored in front of your teeth, but the middle portion of your tongue arches up towards the roof of your mouth. If you want to practice this, if you want to know if you're doing it right, you can get a little stick like this. This is just a, this is a thin kebab stick, okay? But you can use a pickup stick, same deal. You're going to hold it between two fingers. You're going to anchor your tongue behind your bottom teeth, and then you're going to let this rod rest on your tongue and then push it up to make sure you're arching your tongue and if you do so the you'll see the stick dip look so I'll put it here 
and you can see the stick dipping because my tongue is is um, arching in the middle. However, the tip of my tongue is still anchored in front of my teeth. When you play saxophone, your tongue, the tip of your tongue won't be necessarily um, anchored to the bottom of your teeth. Obviously, it'll be near the reeds, and we'll come to that in a second. So that is how you make sure you arch your tongue towards the top of your mouth. Number two, you have to open up your oropharynx. Now, that is a really fancy word for the area of your body, which is the back of your throat, and it's actually the tube that goes down to your uh, to your vocal cords, that whole bit there to the, from the back of your mouth down to here is called your um, oropharynx. Um, well, that whole area is called your pharynx to be precise and it's in three segments. But the segment that's right behind the back of your mouth is called the oropharynx. That's the specific part of the pharynx. The whole thing is called the pharynx, but that's just biology speak. You don't need to know that. Let's just say the back of your throat and then we'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> so in proficient players, that area is opened up. You might call it an open throat, but there's other parts of your throat which are, aren't open, which we'll come to just shortly. <laughs> so you want to create a big space at the back of your, you know, kind of like a, some people might say it's a yawning thing, but it's not really that. But there's a big gap between the very back of your tongue and the back of your throat. So that is something which is observed. The second thing which is observed in players when they're producing overtones. The third thing is you move your tongue as close to the reed as you can. If you touch the reed, obviously, well, that's tonguing. That's not going to work. But the, the tip of your tongue kind of bunches up towards where, the, if that was the reed, the tip of your tongue will bunch closer, like the very tip will be close as you can to the reed. That will increase the resonance effect of your vocal tract, enabling you to produce overtones. Number five, you're going to lower and expand your larynx. Now your larynx is this structure in your throat here. And if you swallow, you can feel it go up and down. Your larynx is where your vocal cords, cords are. They live inside your larynx, this big weird bony thing. The front of it in men is called your Adam's apple, informally. Women also have an Adam's apple, but because their larynx is smaller, their voices are higher, and you, the um, Adam's apple doesn't stick out the neck like men. So that is your larynx, and you're gonna drop your larynx down and kind of expand it to get the overtones. How do you do this? Well, the easiest way is to hold your finger on your larynx, take a bit of a yawn, and then, without keeping the yawn shape, try and keep the low position of your larynx. So there's your normal position. Take a yawn, put it back to normal, and try and keep your larynx down there. That is how you lower your larynx. I've just seen somebody in the comments say, this is looking like the COVID test I had earlier today. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's very similar, actually. Yeah, good point. So lower and expand your larynx. Number six you're gonna extend your bottom jaw forward ever so slightly. This is not a rule which is true of everybody. But some people find it helps that the bottom jaw is ever so slightly in front of your top teeth. So your bottom teeth are moving forward in relation to your top teeth. And finally, for the really, really high uh, altissimo notes, certainly like not before the palm keys at least, you would, oh thank you, um, I've realised I've missed out number four, I'll come back to it, my glamorous assistant has just informed me, <laughs> yeah thank you Russian edition as well, I'll... number four is so important as well, anyway let's just round off number seven, which is you can use a bit more pressure on the reed, now I never normally say this, because it is the number one reason for people having a bad sound is putting too much pressure on the reed. But you might need to do it for some of the very high overtones in the altissimo range. Right. Thank you, everybody, who reminded me I missed out number four. Narrow the glottis. This is one of the most important things that we need to do. So the, uh, the glottis is the area between your vocal folds. What you need to do is for these vocal folds to close down and narrow. They're, I mean, the size of my hands is ridiculous. They're tiny, they're inside here. You need to narrow the gap, and that has the effect, 
look at this slide here. That has the effect of creating a closed system that will generate a strong standing wave in your throat. I haven't got time to go into all the physics of this. You can go and watch my Altissimo video for more details about this. But if you have your vocal folds open, the sound wave will go straight down your throat into your lungs and will be dissipated. However, if you close your glottis, and I'll teach you how to do that in just a second, it has the effect of having a closed door at this point in your throat and the sound wave bounces off it and creates a lot of resonance in this area which dictates the frequency that the reed vibrates at and you will get your overtones out. Now, if you're not doing this, you might go for an overtone or you might go for a high note and nothing will happen. For example, if you want to go for a top F, let's say, And if you're not closing your glottis like this, there's a very good chance that this will happen. So anybody familiar with that noise, let me know in the comments. Another classic example is you go for an altissimo note, you're all excited, you've got your new altissimo fingering chart, you go for your top A, and instead of this, you get something like this. <laughs> and that is because you are not creating sufficient resonance in your vocal tract to control the vibration of the reed, to make it vibrate at that higher frequency. And there's lots of physics behind that, which we're not going to go into today. So there are your seven, um, your seven little techniques that you can try, although you probably need to put them all, most of them, at, at least one, two, three, four, certainly probably five of the top five together to get your overtones. You can get away with it for the first overtone, second overtone, maybe even third overtone, but once you get to that top fourth overtone, you will definitely need to use these techniques, otherwise it won't work. So arch your center tongue, open up the back of your throat, tongue close to the reed, narrow your glottis to create a strong resonance. Now, I forgot to say how you do that. It's quite simple. You do a stage whisper, a few people are saying that in the comments that they miss the high notes here. Welcome to being a saxophonist. Or, as I just discovered, Americans say saxophonist. So there you go, American people. Saxophonist. I'll try and uh, accommodate you as well. Anyway, what you do to narrow your glottis is like a stage whisper or a death rattle. It sounds a bit weird. If you make that kind of sound, then that is going to be the noise that you get when you uh, narrow your glottis, when you close your vocal folds. <sighs> or if you talk in a stage whisper like this, that has the same effect. You're not gonna be making a noise like that when you play your saxophone, but that, and then you can try to, you can sort of close your throat once you know how to do that. And that is really gonna help your high notes. Okay. That is how you produce overtones. Now, I know most people don't get into that much detail. It's because most of the information isn't available, it's not out there, and people just haven't studied the science behind it. You might not need any of this science. You might just be able to play overtones straight away and your body has intuitively worked it out. If so, fantastic, I applaud you. And actually, I never knew this when I learned how to play overtones, so you don't need to know the science necessarily, but these techniques are gonna help you if you're struggling. Right, that is the how. Let's now move on to a few exercises. How to practice overtones to really get the most benefit. Here we go. Just finished the old coffee. Anyone else got a coffee or is people hitting the booze by now? I guess it depends what country you're in, doesn't it? It's lockdown. It's a pretty boozy world in lockdown, isn't it? Anyway, let's cut to the chase here. We're going to talk about some useful exercises for your overtones. Now, let's go straight in with the easiest exercise. The easiest exercise is simply producing the overtone itself. I'm going to use the example of a low B flat, but you can do exactly the, thing, the same thing 
transposed for B flat, B, C, and C sharp. Most of the exercises that you do for overtones are on those first four low notes. Um, if you get the PDF, you'll see that there's a lot more overtones than you can produce than just the low notes, but when we're getting used to the process, we just use B flat, B, low C, and low C sharp. Now, I'm gonna start with the one on B flat, and the easiest way of almost cheating to get the overtone is to play a normal bis key B flat with a regular fingering, then put all your fingers down for a low B flat and try and keep the same pitch. Then, once you've got that overtone, just drop the note down to the regular low B flat. I shall demonstrate, check this out. <laughs> So I played the normal B flat, and then played the low B flat fingering, but kept the same note. Now the note that came out was the overtone, and then I went down to the regular fingering. You can do exactly the same thing for B, C, and C sharp. <laughs> There we go, that is exercise one, which is just producing the overtone. You can do exactly the same thing, although it's not um, it's not pictured there, you can do the same thing, but substitute the B flat for the second octave F, but then it'll be the same. You finger the low B flat and the second octave F will come out, then allow it to drop down like this. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So that is just getting used to producing the overtones. Let's now move on to the second exercise. Now this is the one. This is the mothership exercise. This is the Lord of the Rings. One exercise to rule them all. You can see the process there. Let me just quickly explain what you're looking at. So you're gonna finger and play a low B flat. Then you're gonna allow the first overtone to come out the note, you're going to finger the same note, it's going to go up an octave. The notes with diamonds are the sounding pitch and their overtones. The notes on the bottom row are the notes that you're going to finger. And for this exercise, uh, you can see the fingerings in orange. Okay, so play a low B flat, let the first overtone come out to the octave above, then you're going to alternate between a bis key B flat fingering and a low B flat fingering. So bis key to low B flat, bis key to low B flat. And what you're gonna find is that when the you finger the low B flat, the overtone comes out sounding big and rich and fat and amazing. <clears throat> and when you go back to the bis key fingering, it's gonna sound all weedy and weak. So, you have to use your intuition and experiment with the shape of your mouth and your vocal tract and your embouchure. Anything else you feel is gonna help to make that bis key B flat sound big and fat like the overtone. That is the point of the exercise. Make the thin, normal fingering sound fatter to match the overtone. You can take a breath in the middle of this as you alternate several times between the notes. Then finish on the low B flat. Simple as that. I shall demonstrate for you guys. Here we go. This is the mothership. <laughs> I'll demonstrate that one more time. I'll go up to B this time. It's exactly the same deal, just up a semitone. And you can do exactly the same thing for C and C sharp. You then repeat that process for the second overtone, which is an octave and a fifth above the root. So in the case of B flat, you could use the same exercise, but replace all the diamond B flats for Fs. 
and replace the beef, the, the uh, regular B flat fingering for a second octave F fingering. So this is what it looks like on the second overtone. There you go, that's the exercise, and you can do that for the second overtone, and even the, uh, so you got one, two, you can do that for the third overtone, and even the fourth overtone, which is the third of the root, and a, a double octave and a third above. Now then, I've noticed in the comments, Gary Whitaker says, I have trouble getting B flat overtone on alto, it goes right to F. On tenor, I have trouble getting the low B flat regular, it goes right to the overtone. This is a great comment, and I'll tell you why. Because of the physics of the saxophone, and because it's a conical instrument, conical means, you know, it's a cone. It goes from thin to fat. If you stretch out a saxophone, think of a soprano, it tapers. So we've got a conical instrument. Now, one of the uh, characteristics of this conical brass instrument is that the fundamental is weaker than the first overtone and probably even the second overtone for the first few low notes. So everything else being equal, if you go to blow your sax and you use a low note fingering, it's much more likely that the overtone is going to come out. So anyone that's gone to play a low B flat, for example, on alto, and this happens, don't worry, that is completely natural function of the instrument. It's hard to play low notes. And actually, this overtone exercise is a fantastic way of tuning in the fundamental as well. You'll get great low notes by practicing this exercise. So great comment, Gary. Thanks for that. Um, we, we're stuck with it, I'm afraid. The low notes don't want to come out. That's just what we've got. However, um, if you play clarinet, which is a cylinder instead of a cone, the low notes come out easy as pie. A beginner on clarinet can play the lowest note in the instrument, no problem. But clarinet doesn't overblow an octave. You need a whole different set of fingerings for the second octave. And it's very quiet compared to the saxophone. We've got this big, loud brass instrument, so it's not all bad. Okie dokes. That is exercise two, uh, tone matching. If you only do one exercise ever for the rest of your sax playing <laughs> practice, just do this and your tone. If you do it with the right intention and you try and make that normal fingering fatter, your tone will improve. Believe me, that is my secret. Okay, let's move on to some slightly more advanced exercises now, starting with overtone scales. Now, if you get the PDF from the description, let me just take this slide off, which you can see down here, uh, getyoursaxetogether.com forward slash overtones. That has got a list of all the notes that you can play with different overtone fingerings. And you can uh, take your time and create all the major scales, every major scale in every key, just like this. I've only got one, a D major as an example, and you can finger different low notes to get the overtones out. So, all the, the first overtone you can get on sax is a second, um, well, apart from the, um, you've got the overtones B flat, B, C, C sharp, they're an octave above, but then when you get to D, there's no overtone. So for D, E flat, and E, you have to just not use the octave key, okay? So for these scales, you don't use the octave key for D, E flat, and E. When you get to F, you're into the harmonics, you're in the money. So let's have a little look at this D major scale here. So we're gonna do D without the octave key, we're gonna do E without the octave key, we're then gonna do F sharp, F sharp is gonna be fingering a low B, C is the second overtone, uh, G is the second overtone of C, A is the second overtone of D, B is the third overtone of B, C sharp is the third overtone of C sharp, and high D is the one, two, three, fourth overtone of B flat. Now, if I just played the notes that I'm gonna finger, it would sound like this. I'm only gonna play the notes that I'm fingering right now, okay? Here we go. Actually, some of them are like hidden down the bottom of my screen, that's better, right. <laughs> Now, 
Now you may be wondering, how the hell are you gonna make a D major scale out of that? And the answer is this, check it out. I'm gonna be fingering exactly the same notes, guys. So they are the overtones using the low note fingerings that you can see in the bottom. And you can work out some different ones for yourself and you can work them out in every key using the free PDF, which is linked in the description. So that is your uh, overtone scales exercise. And I'm gonna give you one more, which is another advanced exercise. So don't stress out if it's, you know, if these exercises are too hard for you. They are hard, really hard. In fact, I'm about to demonstrate this exercise and I will inevitably fall on my face. You better believe it. So yeah, it's not easy. This is the uh, Ravel Navy Bugle Call, which we are gonna play exclusively using a low C fingering. You can do exactly the same thing on a low B fingering down a semitone and B flat and C sharp. I'm just doing it on C so you can see um, as an example, really. So, this is <laughs> this is the notes that I'm going to be fingering. <laughs> Fascinating, eh? Now this is what's going to happen when we start accessing the overtones. Try that again, shall we? <laughs> I set myself up for failure, didn't I? Um, I got there in the end. Let's try that again on B. Wow, I should not have put a new read on for this episode, but I'm a, I'm a saxophonist, so uh, I've got to blame the read. As you can see, it's not particularly easy, and I haven't actually, I must admit, I haven't particularly practiced this in quite a while. But that is the exercise. I'll do it once more on low B flat this time. Why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> That is not my greatest ever performance, but you get the idea, it's almost there. By the way, one thing I didn't do is to actually just play the whole overtone sequence right from beginning to end. I'll do that on low B flat and see how high I can get. <laughs> It's more like a squeak really, isn't it? But there's no actually no such thing as a squeak. There's only high overtones that you didn't know you were actually gonna produce. <laughs> but I think I got up to the uh, one, two, third octave B flat there. Um, and that was all just using a low B flat fingering. Um, I used to practice this a lot and I was a bit better at that bugling, truth be told. Anyway, that is the last exercise I'm gonna teach you. Now it's time to have a little recap of everything that we've learned and then I'll start taking questions. So immediately after this recap, get your questions ready and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Okie dokes, let's recap what we've learned. Number one, overtones are what you might call the mothership of all exercises. It really gets you inside how the saxophone works, the very DNA of the instrument. You're playing the instrument from the inside out as opposed to just pressing the buttons and seeing what happens. You're getting insider information, like you're really understanding the very code of the saxophone. To get these overtones, arch the center of your tongue, open up the back of your throat, get that tongue close to the reed as you can, and close your glottis to create that strong resonance which is gonna make the reed vibrate. And finally, we did the exercises, just producing the overtone, matching the tone, which is the most important one, 
we did overtone scales and we did those bugle calls which were a bit hit and miss from my part but I'm sure you get the message and you can see it's actually not the easiest thing in the world to do it's a bit of an advanced one so I hope you've learned something about overtones why they're important how to produce them I'm going to take your questions now so get those questions ready try and stump me let's do this <laughs> Somebody said, are, are the neighbours complaining yet? <laughs> oh, his car. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm in a kind of s supposedly soundproofed uh, studio in the garden, so um, I hope I'm all right. But my wife tells me the soundproofing is pretty rubbish. So, yeah, maybe, they <laughs> maybe my neighbours and indeed your neighbours are going to struggle with that one. Do you know what? Even though I've got my Saks Up Your Sunday mug, it does appear to be kind of empty at the moment. Just saying. Okay, dokes. Let's have a little look what we've got here then. Uh, John D. Hi, Jamie. Would... Uh, how do I put this in there? Like that. Okay. Uh, would low A and baritone produce the same overtone sequence? Yes, it would. As far as I know, it's exactly the same. You've just got a different note to do it on. Uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, this is Teresa. What's the name of the book referenced earlier? It's called From the Inside. Is that going to focus? From the Inside Out by Dr. Mark Watkins. But this book comes with a serious health warning. All right. It is really impenetrable. It's really hard. It's an uncompromising book. Very difficult to understand. And there's lots of pictures of your anatomy that look like things that you've never seen before in your life. It's quite a trip. So, yeah, please do buy it and uh, get into it. But it is uh, whew, it's heavy, man. Let's see what else we got then. Uh, um, let's see. Let's just put this one up. So the Edge TS, I can do the overtones to fourth, but I don't think my embouchure is good. Is it possible to be able to produce overtones with the bad embouchure? Quite possibly you can produce overtones with, uh, if you're biting, overtones might come out, but your tone will be compromised. What else we got? Okay. Al H. I very much enjoyed your ultimate sax, Altissimo video. Thank you very much. But after several times hitting Altissimo notes, then I started getting what I describe is maybe as a soft tip result and then no longer hitting the Altissimo notes. Uh, right. Well, I guess just keep plugging away and these overtones exercises hopefully will give you that strength of resonance in your vocal track that will help your Altissimo range. Uh, Michael Munns. How to get high A on the D overtone. How high A do you mean? Do you mean second octave A? Because that's how you can do it with the low D fingering. Here's second octave A. And here's the same note with a, a fingering a low D. If you mean this A. Then let me see if you can, yeah, potentially you should be able to get that. Oh, yes. Just got more coffee, your beauty. If you're talking about the Altissimo A, you should also be able to get that using a low D fingering. Oh my God, will it work? There she blows. That's the Altissimo A using a low D fingering. I hope that answers your question. David says, it's actually encouraging to see something is hard for you, so thanks for not editing out your fails. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I'm not perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, what's this one? Okay, let's put this one up. This is Larry Katz. In the blues form, four seven, no, one seven, four seven, five seven. Um when playing over the chord changes, the third of the four seven is not in the song's key. Right, let me just um, try and decipher what you mean here, Larry. So if you were in the key of C, let's say to make it simple, you'd have a C7 chord, an F7 chord, and a G7 chord. 
the third of the four seven is not in the song's key. Well, the third of F7 is A, and that is indeed in a C major scale. Uh, maybe I've got you wrong. So if, oh, oh, sorry, I've got another message from you right below. For example, uh, let's add this so everyone else can see it. For example, in the C minor seven blues, the third scale tone of the F7 chord is A flat, which is not in the key of C minor seven. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you're getting confused with your theory. I think one of the first things you should do is watch this morning's video about chord symbols and what the notes are because the third scale tone of F7 is A, not A flat. And it is in the key of C. And if you're in a C blues, it wouldn't be C minor seven, it would be C seven. So maybe you're confused about chords. If so, watch my video from earlier, from today's video. If I've got you completely wrong, re-comment. Um, all right, Bill Dale. The overtone are not exactly in tune, so don't worry about matching pitch exactly. See Steve, Steve Lacey's seminal book. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, in theory, in theory, the overtones should be perfectly in tune. But the saxophone isn't a perfect acoustics system, so sometimes there's variation between different instruments, and you might find that either the tuning of the regular note is right and the overtone's wrong, or vice versa, the overtone's wrong and the regular fingering is right. But you can certainly practice using your larynx to get the tuning of both the overtone and the normal note in tune. And I didn't mention that, but that is another aspect of the exercise which is important. Uh, thanks, Bill. Nice one. A question here from Patelis1. Any advice on finger speed? Yes, I have. Number one, I've done a video called How to Get Faster Fingers on Saxophone using one simple exercise. So go and check out that one. After the event, I'll put that in the link. I'll put that uh, link in the description so you can find the video. But um, in the meantime, you'll have to have a look for it. Uh, the secret about getting fast finger speed is not to play too fast compared to your current technique. So practice uh, whatever technical exercise you're working on and you can get a great one from the video I just mentioned. Um, practice it with a metronome at a speed which you do not fluff. It's probably slower than you think. Practice it perfectly and then and only then speed it up over days, weeks and months and that way your fingers will be fast and they won't learn the bad habits of um, playing it wrong. So if you're screwing something up on a technique practice, slow it down. Don't practice playing things wrong. That's the secret. And you will get there. Your body will learn that motor pattern, okay? Um, who's next? Oh, this is quite a good question. Rick Davis. How big a role does the quality and strength of the reed play in this process? Is it better to play in a harder than normal reed to help initially or vice versa? It is easier to play overtones on hard reeds. It's harder on soft reeds, but it's harder to play low notes with a hard reed. So if you get your hard reed harder reed, you'll find your overtones easier. That might help in the technique about how to get them out, but you might find that you struggle trying to get low notes out. So good question there, thanks. Um, so hi to Albert who says, only breathe of work with the tongue. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't read anything with my, you can tongue the notes. Sometimes it helps to tongue the notes. If you're being a real ninja about it, you wouldn't. You would just go straight to the overtone, but that's a bit more advanced in my opinion. Okay, here's a question from Michael Munns. How do overtones exercises improve overall tone? I'm not sure if you watched the, uh, the start of the video or not, but in that, watch the replay if you haven't, but there's a slide in there uh, which teaches you that in order to produce the overtone, your vocal tract has to be in the perfect position for that note to resonate perfectly. Then when you switch to the normal fingering, you will have the perfect resonance for that note and your tone will be fatter than just having any old shape in your throat. Also, when you do the overtones matching, you are subconsciously working everything available to you to make your normal fingering sound fatter and your sound will just improve because you're consciously trying to make it bigger. Yeah, 
Patelis one is saying I should say improving finger speed. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You just do technical exercises with perfect technique slowly and speed it up gradually. Okay, Ellie Bennett, do you use overtones in your regular playing to give a different feel? Ah, this is one thing that I didn't mention is the extended techniques thing. It's in the list. I mentioned it, but I didn't demonstrate it. Uh, it's a good chance to demonstrate it. What you get, what people like um, John Coltrane and um, following on from that, Michael Brecker especially do, was incorporate overtones into their playing to make them sound cool. So I'll show you one lick. <laughs> I'll show you one lick which demonstrates what I mean. What I am going to do is play second octave C, G, B flat. No, I'm not. I'm going to play second octave C, low C, G, Bisky B flat. Okay, they're the four notes I'm going to finger. These are the notes I'm going to finger. <laughs> But various overtones are going to come out when you play it fast and when you try and sound those overtones and you get a kind of breckery lick. So I'm going to finger those exact notes I just played slowly, but I'm going to play it fast using overtones. <laughs> Sounds better on, everything sounds better on tenor, doesn't it? It does sound better on tenor, but that is how Brecker does those kind of things. And then I was just uh, transposing it in semitones. I'm sure you've all heard that, or something like this. And to do that, you would just play a second octave G, and then, oops, sorry, clip the mic. Second octave G, low C. Second octave, G sharp, but play the G sharp, hot tip, play the G sharp with the C sharp key, low C sharp, and then uh, what am I doing? Nope, I've told you it wrong, my apologies. You do a second octave G, low C, normal F sharp, low B, normal F, low B flat, okay? Second octave G, low C, second octave F sharp, low B, second octave F, low B flat. Now when you do the overtones on the low notes, you basically get G, G, F sharp, F sharp, F, F. That's what comes out. So that's quite a cool lick as well. Hopefully that answers your question. That is a kind of expressive way that you can use overtones in your playing. Actually, the other thing you hear Brecker do a lot is just kind of overtone scoops, right? Like, um... I'm sure you've all heard Brecker do that sort of thing. That's kind of using overtones as well. Um, hope that answers your question, Ellie. Let's see what else we got. Uh, right, there's a question here about saxophones uh, and which brand of Yamaha to play. I haven't played any of them, so I do not know. But maybe somebody else can answer your question, so have a look in the comments. Uh, uh, Niels says, how often do you actually use it when you play? Well, yeah, not like a tremendous amount, but like some of those licks that I demonstrated before, you can do things like that when you're really like on fire and burning. Okay, here's a question from Christopher. Sigurd R's book, and he's referring to, uh, what is it, Top Tones for Saxophone? Yeah. Um... It's referred to as a bedside favourite. What's your opinion of the exercises there? Absolutely fantastic. They are essential and I've got the book and I followed every exercise in that book uh, to improve my overtones and altissimo playing. What I don't do is use his fingerings and very few people do. A couple of them are, are I mean, they all work, but uh, there's better fingerings for the altissimo notes. But the book itself and the exercises and the overtones, the way it's explained, although it's like, 
it is super old school and dated now the presentation and you know it's a bit kind of a bit fusty for these modern times but the information is great and i think it's a wonderful book and i went through it every exercise looking through sorry if i haven't answered your question Okay, quick mouthpiece question. I will indulge you. Ella Elas, which mouthpiece would be best suited on alto tone and which mouthpiece do you play? Uh, on alto, I play this Jody Jazz HR8M. I think it's like an eight star or just an eight, um, which I really like. However, check this out. Pauline just uh, Pauline from uh, Sios just sent me this little beaut, which is my new Sios mouthpiece with get your sacks together, engraved on the side. How cool is that? So I've been uh, I've been experimenting with my new Sios mouthpiece, which has got uh, a baffle in it, which my other one doesn't have, because I wanted a bit of a brighter sound. Um, but I'll let you know how I get on with that. I'll probably do a video on it. On tenor, I've got uh, a vintage Autolink Florida USA model. Uh, it says it's eight star, but I've measured it. It looks like more like a nine to me. I think it's been opened up. So that's the mouthpieces I play. Um, and I don't know how to tell you which mouthpiece. It depends what kind of sound you want and what kind of music you're playing and how strong you are and how you, and how much you um, how hard you blow and a lot of different factors. Uh, osmosis. I think the basic exercises are sufficient for several years. You're damn right. 25 years I've been doing tone matching exercise, literally. Um, Butch Sachs, does reed strength make any difference? I answered that earlier. Yes, hard reeds make it easier to play over tones, but harder to play the low notes. Um, next, is the idea of producing subtones similar to producing overtones, except the opposite result? <clears throat> That's an interesting question. That's what subtone is, a kind of muffled sound. I've got, got a whole video on subtone if you want to learn how to play that. It's an interesting question. It might be because subtone is eliminating as many <clears throat> overtones and um, harmonics from the sound as you can. And it's actually quite easy to come in on subtone very quietly, but it's difficult to come in on normal low notes quietly. One of the advantages of subtone. That's a really interesting thought, Ramesh. I think there's something in that. All right, what we got left? Still quite a few questions, uh, but we're coming up on the hour. I'll see if I can go like quick fire. Thanks for all the questions and thanks for joining me, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. Okay, what we got? Um, right, let's try and do them quickly. You can just read it on the screen. Um, if you put your, if you have your tongue in the wrong place, if it touches anywhere else apart from you know, not touching the reed. If it touches the reed in a weird place, you're, you'll squeak. But it's just it's just practice, and overtones will improve that, I think. Low B flat and alto more difficult. Yep, like I said earlier in the in the video, low notes are hard on saxophone, but the overtone exercises will definitely help your low notes. Um. Same reed and mouthpiece on tenor and alto. I'd play softer. Regis, I'd uh. I don't know about Leger signature. A number two read is on the soft side, I would say. Um, right, David Smith-Clair, can you describe closing the glottis again, how you do it, and how you know you're doing it? Yep, good question. <laughs> Uh, you know you're doing it because your high overtones and altissimo work. <laughs> but you kind of, if you're imagine doing a stage, stage whisper like this, like you're straining your throat, or oh, like a death rattle, that is the action of closing your glottis. And then without doing the noises, you try and just practice. It's almost, it's sort of like a gagging thing, but it's not as distressing as gagging or anything like that. It's not a reflex. That's, um, 
that's about all there is to learning the technique. You just have to practice getting used to it. Um, 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 um. Uh, like Larry, I can see your comment, um, but I haven't got time to answer that one. Only minus, yeah. I'll have to leave that harmony one for later. Um, here's a good one, Carl Widmar. Good to um, good to see you here, Carl. Thanks for your question. Oh, is using a mouthpiece only to work on throat shape a good idea um, to work well with overtones? Yeah, the same thing that you need to bend notes with your uh, mouthpiece only is the similar sort of techniques you need to produce overtones. So yeah, you're quite right, Carl. Good question. Um, right, I'm gonna have to wind it up. So many questions. Let me just choose one more. I'm very sorry if I didn't answer your question. I really appreciate all the questions. Um, all right, last one. I can see this questions from like Marco, Igasi, Ecuador, Miguel, Jonathan. Well, I can answer your question when I see you, so don't worry about that. Javier, Mark Tyler, um, yeah. Um, okay, where's the question that I wanted to answer? Okay, it's actually Paul Proverbs here. Um, how do you use larynx to, to um, affect tuning? I'll show you. The larynx is used to bend notes and to alter the pitch of the note without altering your embouchure. So it's the, the number one way of changing the pitch and tuning notes, which means you don't have to bite hard. It's exactly the same as when I said how to lower your larynx. So if you had your finger there, and then you uh, take a yawn, but then you keep your larynx down there, but then move your mouth back. Now when you're playing, you can bend notes just moving your larynx. That's how you bend notes using your larynx, and it's the number one way that you should be tuning your notes. Okay, I'm very reluctant to sign off, um, but I have to just call it today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. But that's all, folks. You can get the free PDF cheat sheet at... Um, getsaxtogether.com forward slash overtones. That, like I said, has got the chart of all the notes that you can produce with the different fingerings. Very useful resource. If you haven't already watched it, you can go and watch my masterclass, which is a free one hour, fantastic resource there for uh, uh, getsaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. That is also linked in the description below. Uh, once again, thank you all so much for joining me. And to thank you if you're watching on the replay and you couldn't join me. I hope it's some really uh, helpful information for you. And uh, if anybody's bought me a coffee recently, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate every single coffee that you buy me. There's a link in the description if you want to buy me a coffee. To say hi, say thanks for the live stream. Absolutely no obligation. I do all this for free. More than happy just to help sax players get better. But if you want to chip in and contribute to our lowly struggling musician like me, then you can do so using the link in the description. Uh, what's happening next week? I do not know because every week I'm just making a video. Um, but based on my viewing figures, nobody seems particularly interested in learning about the notes of chord symbols. But it is a really important thing for people to know. So sometimes the videos are things that I feel people need to know. And sometimes they're things that you know people are just going to dig. So I think next week I'll just do something that people are going to dig. Maybe it'll be teaching how to play a famous sax thing. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll see you next week on YouTube and I'll see you next month on another one of these lives. Make sure you're on my mailing list from the website and you will of course be informed. Keep practicing hard, keep practicing smart, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you're on the coffees, it's now time to get that drink down you. I'll see you later everyone. Thanks very much. Bye bye.